This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 709, recorded on January 19th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here, it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so everybody knows that's zero degrees Celsius. <laughs> it sure is. That's an easy, easy. one. <laughs> and from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. We've got uh, 67 Fahrenheit. Uh, and occasional showers. And uh, I have to tell you, I got a belated Christmas present, which <laughs> was a replacement for the Galileo thermometer that I broke a while ago. <laughs> uh, I, I did this as a twiv pick one time. Yeah, that's Look right. It I remember. Up. Galileo remember. thermometer. They're awesome. I remember that very much. Yep. Cool. You broke it. Yeah, it was. It happens. I was in. Yeah, I broke it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you like what we do here on TWIV, consider supporting us. We'd love to have your support. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Uh, today, this week, uh, President-elect Biden, although when you hear this uh, podcast, he will be President Biden, has nominated uh, Eric uh, Lander to two positions He's going to be uh, the uh, advisor, science advisor to the president, and uh, he's going to be the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And one of these is going to be elevated to the cabinet level. Which position? Do you know? You guys know? I don't know. I don't is remember. But it's great to have science at the cabinet level. Yes, absolutely. And um, – Kathy, put you put a link to the letter, right, from yeah. Biden to Lander. It's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's just like oh, I have to let's hear it. let's let's look at it, dear you know dear Doctor Lander. He, he cites President Roosevelt, who you know his science advisor was Vannevar Bush, really great science advisor, and so let's he said let's reinvigorate our national science, and he gave him five questions. To think about, like, what can we learn from the pandemic to uh, address the widest range of needs related to public health? How can breakthroughs in science create powerful new solutions for climate change? How can the U.S. ensure it's a world leader in technologies, <laughs> especially in competition with China? That's very interesting. How can we guarantee that the fruits of science and technology are fully shared across America and all Americans? How can we ensure long-term health of science and technology in our nation? That's great. And um, a, few, a few other things are actually very important here. So he has um, – so Lander, of course, is a director, founder and director of the Broad Institute uh, and um, well-known for genomics. He was involved in – the human genome work, but he's uh, Biden also nominated um, Alondra Nelson, who's a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, as president of the social. Uh, she is currently president of the Social Science Research Council. She's going to be deputy director for the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and then Francis Arnold and Maria Zuber will be external co-chairs of the president's Council of, of Advisors on Science and Technology. And you remember, you may remember Francis Arnold won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2018. And we talked about her cool work there. So um, I think this is all propitious for science, don't you? Yep. Mm -hmm. I want to just uh, uh, insert a couple of more things here on Lander. I'm looking at his profile on Wikipedia. He's got a bachelor's degree from Princeton. Uh, and then he... Uh, attended Wolfson College in Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar <laughs> and his, uh, and got a PhD. And his uh, he's trained as a mathematician. So his uh, PhD right. thesis was, just to impress you, on the algebraic coding theory and symmetric block designs. Right. <laughs> and uh, maybe you already said, but he was uh, 
prominent in the genome project. Yeah, he's a smart guy. He'll be good. Yeah. He's outspoken. Just, just right. And he's going to be now at a new level because he's going to have cabinet level and science will be cabinet level, which is great. So I think that's really exciting. I'm just so excited about all of this. Mm -hmm. It's great. And we, you know, uh, the, the current science advisor has been really silent because he's a climate guy and he hasn't been able to get anywhere, right, with the current administration. So that's unfortunate. So I'm looking forward to good stuff coming out of this. Uh, from Kathy, can we have a flu update? Yeah, we can. <laughs> So uh, as Vincent has pointed out before, you can always go to the CDC site and they have uh, updates weekly. And so I put in an image that... Yes, I think the, I can give this to you. Is that the image? Uh, yeah, that was, that's it. Or yep. that is an image. Yep. That's it. Yeah. And this is uh, the percentage of visits for influenza-like illness, ILI, in the United States and the bottom red triangles are <laughs> this season and then Amazing. the other curves are other years and so um there's a couple other years the brown and the orange one that are 2015 2016 and i think 2011 2012 that um haven't at, by this point haven't gone up very much but they have gone up some and then they go up later so it's, it's likely that i think that ILI will go up for this year but it's still completely below what it's been for past years on a week by week basis. So the statistic that I found interesting was 1.7% of patient visits reported were due to uh, influenza like illness. And this percentage is below the national baseline of 2.6%. And then the other one was the link that Daniel had sent us a while back. And it's just a, it just always pulls up the most recent weekly data, a whole set of PDFs. And so I just cut one <laughs> figure out of that. And it's um, the positive influenza laboratory results on a week by week basis. And the red line at the bottom is the uh, this season. And it just hasn't even gotten off the bottom in terms of reports. And I wonder if there's lining? a, is there, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's flatlined. Flat is there, is there a reporting issue here at all? I wonder if the number of people are so busy with other stuff. I wonder if the number of reports is down. Well, you know, it's giving positive influenza lab results. So presumably they're adept at keeping up with sending yeah. in that information. That's all I can say. And, same thing with the percentage of visits. You know, there was that stuff in the middle of the year when the the hospital reporting and so forth was changed by the Trump administration. But I don't think this is maybe related to that. I hope not. Anyway, if you, if you look back at the uh, if you look back at the ILI, you know the the red line. It's not too different from the brown line, which is 2011, right? Right. Right. So, I mean, that was a pretty mild year, I guess. It did go up later, but uh, in that 2011-12 right. season. But right. I, so it may, maybe this is not an, um, an effect of pandemic stuff, right? Maybe it's just a mild year. I don't know. Well, yeah, we'll have to see, but it sure seems coincidental. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you can be fooled by coincidence, right? <laughs> you can, yeah. You can be. <laughs> No, so, and then you said you've had a lot of emails asking if influenza transmission is down, why isn't SARS-CoV-2 down? Yeah, and yeah. it's like comparing apples and ping pong tables. They're, they're two different things. <laughs> but they're respiratory transmitted and you would think a mask should hit both of them, right? Yeah, but still. And, and yeah. but. But whatever we're doing, we should do it every year for flu, right? <laughs> it seems like if, if this, yeah, if this. I don't holds. think people. I don't think people are going to want to do this every year. So, just get vaccinated uh, I'm, for I'm flu. Gonna, right? I'm going to. I'm. I'm going to want to get out a little more. I think. Do you think yeah. that you know? more flu vaccines are being distributed this year than usual as a consequence of awareness? Uh, maybe that's, maybe that's I part. I think of it. there's. You know, there was a pretty big emphasis on getting flu vaccines. Let's see. Um, I'm back on the CDC site to see if they have 
Uh, this is a surveillance site, so I don't have anything on vaccine statistics. Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. All right. I thought we would chat today about, uh, well, as everyone might know, the WHO has convened a committee to go to China and study uh, the origins of SARS-CoV-2. And there's a a big PDF over at the WHO site. It's called WHO Convened Global Study of the Origins of SARS-CoV-2 Terms of References for the China Part. (laughs) That's a funny... That's a funny title. Actually, this is from last July, but it kind of... So this idea of having a a committee go over has been incubating since last year, but they finally got permission to go, I understand. And one of the members I know is Peter Daszak. There are 10 people. I don't know who the others are. And apparently he's there. Um, So finally, it took this long to get it there. And I thought this is actually an interesting report. It's got some good summaries. Um, And this... It began in February 2020. The WHO actually convened this uh, committee to uh, develop a blueprint for understanding the origin of the virus. And so um, they together, WHO together with China put up this committee uh, to do a series of studies. And I want to just talk about some of these studies today because they're a little bit interesting, a lot interesting. And they start with a nice background. You might want to read this document. It's... uh, it's actually quite interesting. And so it's perfectly readable, and it's only about – the actual text is only about six, seven pages long. Yeah. So they start by saying, where an epidemic is first detected does not necessarily reflect where it started. And they talk about how SARS-CoV-2 was first you know, detected by surveillance in, in Wuhan. But they also mentioned that several other countries have – but think they have found cases earlier – then the first case is in Wuhan. And they said this has to be followed up because maybe that's true. And we don't know about it. But they give a nice background on, on what happened in Wuhan. And, they, and they, then they say current knowledge supporting origin tracing work. And they talk about phylogenetic work. And they say um, uh, that the virus, you know, in the beginning seemed to be well adapted to human transmission when it was first detected we don't know what it was like before that. And they make the point that uh, two of the genetically closest known coronaviruses, RATG13 and RMYNO2, those are two bat isolates that we've talked about. RATG13 is from 2013. RMYNO2 from, uh, uh, I don't remember what year, 2018 or 19. So the tw- RATG13 has 96% sequence homology with SARS-CoV-2, and they point out that the genetic distance is still a difference of 1,200 nucleotides. So they say RATG13 is a distant ancestor of SARS-CoV-2. And I point this out because many people still say, oh, they're working with RATG13 in the lab over there, and it got out, and it just can't be. It's too It's too yeah. distant. <laughs> so um, I'm having trouble recalling were they mm-hmm. actually even working on the virus in no, the lab? I don't weren't. think so. Right? No. They have sequence. That's it. They had they sequence. Never made virus. Yeah. They had a little bit from the RNA polymerase that came up in a blast search with SARS-CoV-2. And then they went back to the freezer and pulled out the rest of the sample and sequenced it then. But they didn't have virus. Yeah. Right. We did that in an episode. Nevertheless, yeah, They went you back know, and did that sequencing after the pandemic was already underway. That's right. Right. That's absolutely right. Yet articles have continued to emerge saying, oh, you know, they're working on RATG13 and that's – it's too distant, folks. It's well, distant. It, yeah, and this, and this is a good example of people not understanding the difference between having sequence on the one hand and having virus on the other hand, okay? Yeah. There's a big yeah. difference. And, you know, these 1,200 nucleotide differences, they're not just in one place – that you could swap out. They're scattered throughout the 30,000 base genome. So who would change them all? Who would do, nobody would do that. (laughs) If you proposed it to anyone, they would say, forget it, don't do it. Not only that, but the majority of them, probably if you look at them, you would say, like, why? Okay. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Now, then the other thing they talk about, so the main focus is trying to figure out where 
this originated. And they're saying, you know, wildlife, bats clearly are, have the ancestral virus, but are other animals involved? And they say, you know, cats, domestic cats, ferrets, hamsters, minks have been shown to be susceptible. Other other species like bats, tree shrews, non-human primates, and of course, deer mice. It's not on this list, but <laughs> Tony uh, was at that. They do mention mink on on at yeah. that point. Had they uh, had had? Did we know about the tigers in the Bronx Zoo? I don't know. They're mentioned in here. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. But the, the gorillas weren't known at that point. No. Correct. I think no, those correct. are pretty recent, right? That was last week, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I wrote this in the margin and was ready to say, but I couldn't find it in time. Cats, ferrets, hamsters, and mink. Oh, my. Cats, Very ferrets, good. hamsters, and mink. <laughs> oh, my. Could be a title. Yeah. Show, can remember. Show title. Yeah. Show title. <laughs> it could be a title. Yeah. So they say these results demonstrate that different animal species in regular contact with humans are susceptible to infection and could serve as intermediate host species. So, I mean, remember, SARS-1 went from bats to palm civets to people. So it could be an intermediate. We don't could know. Could be. Doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be. Um, but that's part of the job of this team. They want to figure that out. And then they talk about food and surfaces and contamination. And they say recent outbreaks have raised questions about the potential role of food products as a vehicle. And they say, you know, there's this market outbreak in Beijing, which suggested that food items might be contaminated. But they say there's no evidence that food items may have cont contributed to transmission anywhere. And they say we have to do more data collection on this. But so far, there's no evidence for food uh, transmitting infection. I would guess you'd have a foodborne outbreak if you if it did, right? Because you can easily pick up foodborne outbreaks. You'd say, yeah. Yeah, I think it would probably be pretty obvious. <clears throat> um, then they talk a little bit more about the, the uh, Wuhan. And they say it's a city with a good surveillance system. And that's where we first picked up the outbreak, but it could have started elsewhere and we didn't pick it up because other places might not have good surveillance, right? Right. Uh, and they um, talk about how the early cases in Wuhan in early December. and they, 124 of them. <laughs> yes. And no, surveillance of severe pneumonia suggests no unusual cluster or departure from trends in the weeks and months preceding the first case in Wuhan. And, you know, I noticed that uh, that document, Rich, that you circulated to us from the um, from Pompeo, right? As you oh, said, he's trying well, to leave stuff Depart behind. Department of Department of State. Department I blame of it State, on, right? I'm, I'm, you know, he's he's the head of that operation, right? He said, you know, there was there were a lot of illnesses, respiratory illnesses at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, you know, before this. And according to this, there's none. There's no unusual cluster of infections. And I I believe the WHO, right? I don't know where the State yeah. Department gets this that, information. Uh, that State Department document reads as if somebody read that. Where was, the, uh, what was that article yeah, recently? New York, was it New York, New York yeah. Post? New York or Magazine. Fiction thing. Yeah. Science, New York Science Magazine. Fiction. It's yeah. almost as if somebody read that and picked out the, the juiciest uh, uh, conspiracy theory type yeah. uh, bits and stuck it into a State Department document. Yeah, and they also had RATG 13 in the New York Magazine article. They right, said and, they, uh, and they said, at least in the State Department document, and this is one of the reasons I was thinking about this yeah. and checking on it, they say in the State Department document that they were working on that virus in the Wuhan lab. No. Yeah. No. Not true. They were not. Yeah, that's what people don't get. Just because you have some sequence doesn't mean you're working on it. I talk a little bit about the Huanan market. Um, oh, yeah. And all the stuff they have there. So they, <laughs> they list a bunch of animals. Okay. Chipmunks, foxes, raccoons, wild boar, giant salamanders, hedgehogs, sika deer. And then they go on and talk about farmed wild and domestic animals that were also traded at the market, including snakes, frogs, quails, bamboo rats, rabbits, crocodiles, and badgers. Yep. I don't know why they split up the two lists of, of animals there. I guess the first ones were wild and the other ones were yeah. not as wild, but yeah. So if you remember, and uh, I had forgotten this, the market was closed on January 1st, 2020, and they did a bunch of sampling, 336 samples collected from animals, none of them PCR positive for SARS-CoV-2. 
but 69 out of 842 environmental samples were positive, which I mean is, uh, I guess, swabbing surfaces, right? Of their uh, mm-hmm. various sorts. And, uh, 22 were from eight different drains and sewage. And three viruses were isolated, sequenced, and shared on GISAID. And they were virtually identical to the patient samples collected at the same time. So the patients shed them and they ended up in the environment, I guess. But they conclude that it remains unclear whether the market was a contamination source, acted as an amplifier for human-to-human transmission, or a combination of those. So they don't conclude that it started there. And I think that's what we have said for some time now after the initial thought, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. I forget. Do they say here uh, uh, about assaying employees in the market? What, they don't uh, discuss that, I don't think. Okay. I don't remember saying, seeing anything about employees but, per se. So, so we have animals, learned, yeah. we have learned, you know, since the outbreak that super spreading events happen and they're a major cause for, uh, f- uh, for amplifying the virus. And yeah, so I yeah. would imagine, and I, I, I should remind listeners that one of the reasons there's all this focus on the mi- uh, market is because there have been spillovers of other viruses, include, including the original SARS, that involve an intermediate host uh, that are, are pretty clearly linked to a market where you mix up uh, potential intermediate hosts and, and, and humans. And so when the first few cases seemed to have some association with the market, everybody goes, oh, that's it, right? But yeah. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. It could just be a super spreading event. No, I think uh, there's a graph in an NEGM JM paper of that that market outbreak, and a couple of the uh, cases, uh, the earliest cases, were not even associated with the market. So yes, they got it somewhere else. So they conclude we we know very little about how, where, and when the virus started circulating, and that's what they want to find out by this study in part. So that's the background. Then they have an implementation plan. There's a short-term study, phase one. And then longer-term study, phase two. So short-term study include descriptive epidemiology, looking at hospital records. You see how far back you could go and see anything that looks like COVID-19. And, you know, we know some unique uh, aspects of the disease now that maybe you'd be able to pick up. Uh, Surveillance trends for disease, trends of all-cause mortality, interview people, see what's going on. And then, of course, serological studies of samples collected months before. That would be great. And I'm surprised that I know it's been done in some other countries. I'm surprised it hasn't been done uh, in China and Wuhan area in particular or elsewhere in China, right? It would be interesting to know. And then part of that is an analytical epidemiology study to see if any factors are associated with an early part of the outbreak. I don't quite know what that means. It's too vague for me to understand it. But okay. So well, so first there's the descriptive epidemiological study, and then there's the analytical. And so the, yeah. in this one, they're testing. Yeah, they're testing specific factors. Mm. Um, so they talk about the study design as case cohort design. Um, so this. they also include an approach to explore exposures within the market in more detail. Okay. With so highly they take, data, yeah. they take yeah. data from the first part and you and look yeah, at it. that's what it, it reads to me as if the first part, the descriptive epidemiological study, is just collecting data, and the second part is using that data to develop uh, models or you know trends, like whatever they can. Or, yeah, yeah. And there's another part called animals, products, and environmental study, mapping of activities and items traded at the Huanan and potentially other markets in de- November and December. Unfortunately, they're all gone, so I can't sample them, you know? Yeah. They want to, and then map the supply chain for all the animals, right? Where do they come from? And see if you can track back and maybe find something. I think they did that with civets, right? They went back into the farms where they were from. Yeah. And then yeah. testing frozen sewage samples for evidence of circulation before December. That's interesting. I didn't know they kept frozen sewage. Yeah, it's a new one to me. Yeah, me too. 
<laughs> Interesting. But yeah, you could do that because now people are tracking it in sewage, right? It's quite interesting. So all of that is phase one. Um, and, and then phase two is longer term plans, of course, which they say are based on what we find in phase one, but could include more in-depth uh, epidemiology, virology, serology in specific places, uh, both in humans and in animals. And it's pretty vague because they say really the phase two depends on what we find in phase one. But trust us, we'll do the right thing. <laughs> well, it's kind of like when you write a grant, you know, yeah. you, yeah. you can <laughs> propose out so far and then you have to say, well, we're going to, we're going to yeah. see what we get and then yep. we'll, yep. yeah. But here's an example of what we would do if we got some of this data. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> then, then the last part is uh, the team composition. They say it's an international team, wide range of expertise from China and several other countries, including experts in public health, animal health, human-animal interface, epidemiology, virology, genomics, environmental health, food safety, among others. I don't know who's on it except for Peter Daszak. I looked and I couldn't find anything on several different sites. So, it's a But I could tell you who I might pick if it were up to me. <laughs> I would get Marion Koopmans for sure, you know, animal-human interface in terms of viruses. She would be great. Uh, some genomics people like Eddie Holmes or Andrew Rambeau or others, plenty of those. Um, epidemiologists. Lin Fa would be good. Um, uh, and Adam Kuchar Kucharski, right? He would be a good one. Mm -hmm. Anyway, lots of people, but I don't know who it is. And I'm not part of it. And um, I think if you go there, you got to be quarantined for two weeks, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I've seen so pictures I, of Peter Daszak on a bus in China somewhere with a face mask. You know, they took pictures of him through the bus window. Sorry, Rich, go ahead. My, my, my sort of bottom line on this is they're going to scour the place. They're yeah. going to look everywhere they possibly can for any evidence of infection and what might have been uh, the the virus infecting at the time and uh, and when it happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And see if they can, you know, find any patterns at all. And there's no, there's no, no real assumption no. that uh, it started in Wuhan. Uh, in Wuhan, that's that's what they're trying to figure out. Yeah, and, and it's important uh, for for the future to try and figure out where this kind of stuff comes from. So you would think that, you know, if something happened at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, this group will be able to figure it out, right? Right. Uh, you would think so. One would hope they have access. You know, the thing about China is that they could be limited into what, what – no, we can't show you those data. You know, it's top secret. So I don't know. But maybe it took this long to agree to the committee. Uh, now they're, they're content. I, I just have no idea. I'm talking uh, – Well, and um, at the risk of seeming political, but it is, <laughs> it, it is a political thing, I would hope – that with the new administration in place, uh, there's a little less, perhaps a little less um, anxiety uh, from China on uh, being blamed for this, mm -hmm. okay? Because that's been a problem, okay? Mm -hmm. This is no longer going to be the China virus. Right, right. All right, so we had an email, probably many, but this one I picked up. Relating to this uh, committee, it's from Anana Moose, which they write is like the dessert, Moose. <laughs> Dear Twiv, thank you for all you are doing to bring clarity and calm in this uncertain time. Your show brings knowledge and comfort to many people. My questions relate to WHO and its current investigation into the first stage of the outbreak. One, what are the, polit what are the implications of virological, epidemiological, and other related research being subject to political control in mainland China? Does this prevent Chinese researchers and scientists from conducting and publishing research as they wish? I guess the, the question is whether the research of this team is going to be able to be done and published, right? And well, I don't know. Yeah, not no only idea. that, but whatever is ongoing in China. Uh, Anonymous, by the way, has links uh, in this letter that I uh, I think I read through all of them this uh, first one is uh, particularly good. What's it's an AP article? Mm. Is that right? Yeah. 
Yeah, Associated right. Press. Uh, and it describes uh, the uh, measures from the Chinese government to control the message. And, you know, I kind of get it in a way uh, because um, shortly into this, uh, people started, you know, shaking their fingers at China. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the most obvious example is calling it the China virus, okay? And, uh, you know, the, the Chinese government doesn't want to deal with that. Uh, and also, they, uh, the, uh, the doctor, what was his name? Oh, yeah. uh, it's a little bit further down, right? In this, Lee, uh, yeah. Lee Wen uh, Yeah, who, uh, you know, basically said this is a, this is a big deal. And uh, it's not being reported properly. And uh, the Chinese government doesn't want any of that n nonsense. They want to control the message. Okay. Um, that, that's it. They want to control the message. Now, what those controls consist of, does that mean that information that comes out is false? Not necessarily. It might mean that uh, they, uh, they suppress uh, you know, uh, things that are, you know, I don't know, that they deem as outrageous claims or whatever, even conspiracy theories, the rest of it, they want to control the message. In a sense, I don't blame them. Okay? Yeah. yeah. No, I have not no saying, idea the extent to which they're going to control this narrative at right. all. I have no idea. Right. I mean, and and, and uh, I think... Uh, the question here from Anonymous is, does this prevent Chinese researchers and scientists from con conducting and publishing research as they wish? Uh, well, what we have from these documents is that if you want to publish something, okay, it has to be vetted, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I, beyond that, I don't know. Uh, certainly, uh, there hasn't, uh, I mean, the... The Wuhan lab in particular has been enormously productive and uh, uh, published globally on these issues for a long time. Yeah. Uh, whether that's so, I don't know that there's going to be any significant restriction on research. Could be they're going at it tooth and nail, trying to figure out on their own what's going on, but they're just not telling everybody what they find out right now. I don't know. Yeah. Right. It's hard to know. Uh, second question, why has the WHO team been so delayed in starting their investigation? Does this make it harder to obtain evidence and data from the early days of the pandemic? I don't know the answer, but I would suspect that's been delayed because, first of all, they probably didn't want it to happen. And so there was a lot of negotiation. And then they negotiated on who was going to go. And they probably picked people that had been there and they knew, like Dashak, right? He's been there many times. Mm -hmm. Um and, and Lin Fo Wong, it, right? Like you said, might be him. Right. Yeah, because he'd been there many times. But does it make it harder to obtain evidence and data from the early days? Of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, we knew right away that they shut down and hosed out the market and so forth. I mean, we knew way back when that they'd lost a bunch of data. Yeah. So, yeah. And then finally, why in your view were clinicians such as the late Dr. Lee and colleagues pursued by authorities when they alerted others? to the coronavirus in its first stages, and why were journalists such as Zhang Zhang jailed for reporting on the Wuhan outbreak? Pfft. Your guess Again, is as good as mine. <laughs> yeah, wanting to control the message. Yeah. You know, if, if you want to make it seem like there's not really a pandemic and things are under control, we're going to silence anybody who tries to claim otherwise. Uh, this is a really hard issue. You know, I don't, I don't, uh, necessarily agree with uh, politically controlling the message, in particular when it comes to the actual science itself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On the other hand, we are very recently uh, victims of an uncontrolled message dominated by conspiracy theories and stuff. So, you know, the flip side of controlling a message can get out of hand on its own. So, I don't know what the middle way is. The middle way, saying, I suppose, is having an enlightened and educated uh, population and administration. Good luck with that. So what you're saying, Rich, <laughs> is that the U.S. is not innocent in these areas. 
Uh, well, yeah, in a way. <laughs> Actually, they're not innocent with either controlling the message or letting it get out of control. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Well, good questions. But hopefully All we get some questions. data. We'll see. All right. So, um, uh, by the way, folks, if you have a question for Daniel Griffin, please send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Otherwise, they get mixed up in the TWIV email bag, which is very big, and it's easy to get lost. And uh, daniel at microbe.tv. Uh, Kathy, would you read that first one, please? Adrian writes, haiku for you. Smiles hidden by masks, worn by them to protect me, still light up their eyes. It's That's good. Right. Five seven yeah. five, right? Yeah, yeah. I like I, that uh, because I, that's I, I true, struggle, right? Yeah, I, I struggle with this because you see somebody with a mask and you yeah. go, yeah. you know, you can't really see the whole smile. You got to kind of look even more closely than you would ordinarily at their For eyes sure. and try and figure out whether there's a smile under there. You know, it. It's. Tr I have trouble recognizing people, but you can tell when someone's smiling from their eyes, right? Yeah. You can. Yeah, they call it smizing, smiling with your eyes. <laughs> Interesting. I like that very much. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one? Uh, Christoph writes, hey, Vincent, I am the listener that did the mice lie, mon monkeys exaggerate, etc." cetera, button. <laughs> uh, naturally, I'm a fan of Daniel, so threw this together for fun. Feel free to use it for whatever you like or not. If I can think of a good of good catchphrases or other ideas, I might do a series of silhouette style designs for you. Uh, regards all the best for 2021. Keep up the good work, Christoph. Mm -hmm. And he's got a, a an image here, a picture for a button that's a a silhouette, more or less, of a guy in a tux uh, with a coronavirus like badge on his soldier, and it says under it. Griffin, Daniel Griffin, licensed to heal. So I guess that's a spin on 007. Yeah. yeah. Licensed to kill. I guess I could yeah. show this here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And then also because it, you know, Daniel always wears bow ties. Yep. That's yeah. appropriate too. Good point. But yep. I think in the way the head is, it's you can see it's Daniel, can't you? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, it's, 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 I don't know. Has he got hair? No. Yeah. It's got a smidgen uh, of hair, yes, over on uh, his right. I guess Daniel, Daniel has a fringe. Yeah, he's got so. this yeah. way of of his head sitting that uh, this, I don't yeah, know, maybe I've seen him too much. It's definitely but. to me like Daniel. I yeah. think he got it from an image somehow. I think yeah. it's great. I think it's really yeah. cool. Yeah, it would be cool to do one for each of us, Christoph. That would be fun. So thanks a lot. Okay, um, Tim. So this is a letter about the excess COVID deaths in 25 to 44-year-olds that we talked about a while ago. And then we had a letter from a young'un, Stephen. And so I think this is in response to that. Hi, ho, Twiverinos. I apologize for the rant, but this is an important letter, which is not deserving of the criticism from Stephen, no matter how well-intentioned. The letter meaning the original article, I believe, on the mm -hmm. excess death. Mm -hmm. So Stephen summarizes his points as, my questions to you are then, bullet point, have you considered the issues raised above and is my concern regarding the risk of counterproductivity valid? Bullet point, is there data, are there data that can be used to help provide a more granular view on relative risks for different population segments and bullet point can and importantly should, perhaps they shouldn't, scientists, doctors, governments strive to deliver a more granular slash detailed message about risk factors to communities. And now we're back to Tim. One, any of the anti-masker, anti-vaxxer, anti-science activists will try to make these claims, but they are more than adequately addressed in the published letter, which is not remotely presented as capable of capturing the granularity of data Stephen desires. Two, the researchers used the data available and made it clear this is a limitation. This is an expected limitation of using publicly available data. It is publicly available and does not provide the granularity Stephen would like. Three, in the letter, the researchers do not make any excessive claims about the information they are providing. The researchers are clear about the limitations of the information available and the conclusions drawn. This is an important analysis of data that apparently exposes an underappreciated risk group. 
The criticism of the paper is due to unreasonable expectations of what can be obtained from the publicly available death data. We should not expect nor encourage researchers to find results that are not supported by the evidence. Good point. <laughs> We know from other reporting that otherwise healthy people in the 25 to 44-year-old group are dying from COVID-19. That is not new. What is new is the rate, rate of death among 25 to 44-year-olds of unknown health status. Furthermore, the authors state, and this is a quote, only 30% of all cause excess deaths in adults aged 25 to 44 years recorded during the pandemic were attributed directly to COVID-19. Although the remaining excess deaths are unexplained, Inadequate testing in this otherwise healthy demographic likely contributed. These results suggest that COVID-19 related mortality may have been under underdetected in this population. I understand that Stephen means well, but RTFM, read the effing manual or material. There is a test and luck is the overwhelming factor. The results of this show that luck was against over 4,500 people in the otherwise healthy 25 to 44 age group. Place your bet on your luck and the luck of your neighbors, family members, coworkers, friends, but do it wisely, recognizing that the granularity of data you would like is not available. Stephen appears to want certainty for which he should consult an astrologer or a priest or a politician. Scientists provide caveats because science has ethical standards. This is betting lives. So I will always go with the science and try to appropriately interpret the limitations provided by the scientists. The scientists include the limitations for that reason. Tim, I thought that was wonderful. Really yes, wonderful. very well said. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we get in trouble because we equivocate. Uh, because, you know, uh, that's the nature of our business. Very few scientists are going to say, uh, that, you know, anything is 100%. I, uh, Vincent said the other day that uh, reverse transcriptase uh, transcribes RNA into DNA, uh, pretty definitely. <laughs> I'll go with that, okay? <laughs> but, <laughs> but a lot of other stuff is, is indefinite, and we're honest about it because that's the way we think, that's the way we're trained. But uh, that's not necessarily what the public is used to hearing, and they want a more definite message. I'm sorry, that's not reality. I think I probably and us on TWIV probably made more conclusions from that paper than the authors did, right? And maybe that's why Stephen didn't like it because often I often do that. By the way, I also Rich, like. I, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. I, I also by the like way, this. <laughs> Rich, go first. I like this new trend that Kathy uh, uh, highlighted a few episodes ago of putting a section in the papers that are the limitations of the data. Yeah. Okay, and spelling it out. I think it's good. Um, Rich, there's only one thing that's 100% from your poem last week. We're all going to die. Yep. 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 I was just thinking that because yep. I just listened to that this morning. Um, for those who are interested in more information about excess deaths, yesterday's New York Times printed a full page. <laughs> they did a deep dive into the data of uh, excess deaths. And it only runs through December, and they claim that it's 400,000 excess deaths since March, and it's an 18% increase. Uh, where did I? Uh, I lost it. Um, anyway, it's it's very well done. They have it by state. They have New York City pulled out from the rest of the state. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting to take a look at. So, just on excess deaths. Okay. Um, Kathy, you are next. Lucas writes, Hi, I'm from Brazil. And first, I want to say I love your podcasts. Since the beginning of the pandemic, I try to listen to you. Congratulations for the excellent work. Last week, January 17th, Anvisa, the Brazilian equivalent of the FDA, approved the emergency use of CoronaVac and AstraZeneca vaccines. And immediately we started to use CoronaVac. The AstraZeneca vaccines are not yet ready. Both vaccines will be produced in Brazil. The last podcast, I got the sense that the CoronaVac isn't as good as Pfizer or Moderna. However, our health authorities said that even if it's not perfect, the CoronaVac will be helpful to relieve our hospitals because the studies show that it can help to prevent the severe form of the disease. Can you talk a little bit more about the effect of the CoronaVac on preventing the severe form of COVID, please? I'm not a scientist. I went to law school, so please try to put it in simple words. Thank you so much, Lucas. 
P.S. Even with our limitations, not a rich country, Brazil has a good vaccination public system. So I think it will be interesting to keep an eye on here to see, uh, to evaluate CoronaVac and the AstraZeneca vaccines. I think we went over that uh, last week, right? The, the inactivated vaccine, correct? Uh, yes. And we did it pretty thoroughly. I would just say, uh, you know, uh, one of the problems here is we don't actually have any face retrial data. Okay. Mm. So we don't really know uh, what the, uh, what does he want? Um, Coronavac. Uh, but uh, talk a little more about the effect in preventing a severe form of COVID. We just don't know. Okay. I think the, the hope is that, uh, uh, a lot of these vaccines that may not be uh, scored as, uh, you know, 95% effective in preventing uh, coronavirus uh, severe disease um, are would be much more effective in prevent. I'm sorry, preventing. What am I trying to say? That uh, they're, they're, uh, tr- Efficacy, well, we don't know how it's scored in these guys. We haven't seen the phase three trial. That's right. They're usually That's scored right. by infection, right? Don't mm-hmm. really know how severe the infection is. And what we're hoping is that a lot of these, uh, even if they're um, not 100% uh, effective in preventing uh, disease completely, will be significantly effective in preventing se- severe disease. But we don't know. That's right. The paper um, we did discuss was only phase one, two. I forgot about right. it. It's not the phase three. Yeah. We don't have those yet. Right. You know. We don't have phase three data from anywhere. So, okay? we, so we just uh, don't We just don't know. We're hopeful. I mean, with the uh, Moderna it, and Pfizer, we had uh, data on preventing severe COVID, right? Because a number of the placebo recipients got severe disease. Right. But we don't right. have that for this one. Stay uh, tuned. And I'm about to go. I want to, I want to uh, second this bit. Uh, he says in his PS, Brazil has a good vaccination public system. Uh, yes, indeed, they do. Uh, mm-hmm. They they have this. Um, they call it uh, these. They do immunization days. Okay, they sort of right. pioneered that strategy, uh, and they're they're really set up to do this kind of stuff. So it will be interesting to see how they do. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. See Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida in Gainesville. Currently, he's in Austin, Texas. He will be back next week. Thank you, Rich. Yep. See you. Bye. When Albert Sabin was making, uh, testing his uh, polio vaccine, he went to Brazil and did national immunization days because he, he, he went into their programs where twice a year they do massive immunizations. And he showed you could give his OPV twice a year and it would knock down polio. And that led to the W. He did this in the 80s. And he, so it was after he had, it was after he had tested it. I misspoke. It was when it was licensed and being used in many countries, but he wanted it to be used more. And he convinced WHO that you could do global immunization like that. And eventually that led to the uh, eradication plan of WHO because they said, look, it works in Brazil. You can do that. I have to interrupt. Do you want to change where our name labels are on our pictures? Oh, my gosh. Look at that. They're all floating. The other day I had Daniels up by his chest for like a quarter of the episode because I didn't pay attention. Okay. And then once it's there, you can't get it out. Maybe okay. it's a good reason not to have name labels, right? <laughs> I think it's fine. All right. Uh, I guess it's my t- – did Rich go last? Okay. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. okay. So we Bethany writes, uh, hello, Twiv crew. Thanks to all for all you do to keep the rest of us up to date. I have declared Vincent to be my Bob Ross of the pandemic. Okay. Who is Bob Ross? He's Bob? the painter guy. Oh, He's with a, the fuzzy hair. Yeah. Yeah. I had I want, to look him up too. I thought, I thought that's who he was, but he's yes. the painting guy. I do remember him. Yes. But yeah. He, he's an uh, American painter, art instructor and television. Yeah. He, he created the joy of painting, right? That's right. Yeah. So we need to have the joy of viruses, although probably people wouldn't like that because they don't bring joy <laughs> to a lot of people. Okay. I just finished listening to episode 706, during which there was a discussion about vaccine tracking. When I received my first COVID vaccine, I was encouraged to sign up for vSafe, a free monitoring and reminder system 
from CDC. For the first few days, I received daily text to check for symptoms. Then when the 21 days started to roll around, the text started checking to see if I had received my second dose. Not perfect, but certainly helpful. And she provides a link. Did you also mention this, Kathy? I don't remember. Yeah, that's it's the same thing I mentioned. And and as I said, it's you know, it's through the CDC. You opt in. It requires a smartphone. So those are two disadvantages. But mm. it seems like this could be a model for them to build out and use for lots of other vaccines that mm. are multi-dose. You know, the HPV, yeah. Shingrex, the pneumococcus, all of those kinds of things. Yep, yep. Footnote, I'm an OBGYN provider in New Mexico and have noted a recent increase in vaccine data flowing into our EPIC-based EHR. It isn't perfect, but an improvement over complete radio silence. <laughs> Stay well, Bethany. All right, that's good to know. Kathy. Mm -hmm. Hillary writes, best of twivers. I've got an appointment for my first vaccine dose in a couple of days, which makes it feel like there's going to be a future this year. One of the things I'd most like to most like to restore is the freedom to go out with a group of like-minded non-pod people and look for birds together, sharing the best views through spotting scopes. My scope hasn't left the closet since the California lockdown in mid-March. Scopes want to be shared, and all the early publicity about sanitizing every surface seemed to say that sharing optics would surely spread the disease. Yeah, if viruses can't love, scopes can't want but they do, or at least they trigger that response in their owners. <laughs> Seeing a bird in your own scope is all very well, but it ain't real until someone else looks down the bore, adjusts the focus and goes, wow, look at that. And the more views, the better. So if everyone involved is a couple of weeks past their second shot, what extra precautions would we need? Keep wearing masks, avoid carpools, or drive with the windows open? Was the sanitize every surface every time advice overdrawn? And if not, will vaccination reduce the risk to acceptable levels? You've been an anchor to sanity for more than 100 podcasts, but uh, you don't tweet and flutter about. <laughs> I think that's a reference to birding as well. <laughs> yeah, because some um, of us tweet, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think the advice is, well, if everyone involved is a couple weeks past their second shot, Keep wearing masks. Well, you know, if the vaccines are 95% effective, there's, you know, I guess there's still 5% chance that any one of you could still get the disease. So if, um, or, and not, and not be fully protected in other words. And so I think wearing masks is still going to be a good idea. Avoiding carpools. I, I think that might be excessive. You, and you, live in California, you could drive with the windows open. Um, but yeah, I think at some point, again, if everybody's, if everybody's vaccinated, I, I don't know. And then the sanitize every surface, every time advice. I think if you've learned to wash your hands and sanitize your hands, now this putting your eyes on the scope optics thing, maybe that's an issue. And if it's easy to do, then you just sanitize that. I don't know. What do you think, Vincent? You know, there hasn't been a lot of data on surface transmission. I think uh, the number is about 10% of all transmissions are on surfaces. So I, you can you can sanitize the the, the uh, scope, right? You could just have a wipe, uh, an ethanol wipe, and and wipe it. I think if you're going to share it with someone else, I think that'd yeah. be fine. Of course, if they're wearing glasses, then you don't have to worry. So that's a right. consideration. But you know, T Tony Fauci said the other day that please keep wearing your masks because we're not sure how much transmission a vaccinated person will do. We're doing studies to figure that out now. He said. And we'll let you know in a few months, right? So the question is, right now we know the vaccines prevent disease, but we're not sure about transmission. Hopefully it will d knock down transmission, right? Uh, otherwise it's a big problem. But for now, he said, keep wearing masks, keep doing your distances and all that stuff. So, I And then going out further, we don't know how long the uh, mm. protection is going to last. We don't know the durability. Yeah. So. We don't, but we hope it's at least a year. You know, I I could go for a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine every year. That's fine. Yeah. 
like over yeah. a flu vaccine, right? Right. Um, but yeah, it's a little uncertain. I'm sorry to say that, but at least we have something and, you know. Yeah. Th- and by the time everyone in your group is has two vaccines, maybe there'll be more clarity about some of these things. But, you know, wearing masks isn't that hard and cleaning your scope isn't that hard. So I mean, I, I may go teach a class in person in April if I have two shots already, but I will ma- wear a mask. When I do that, it's a small class of 10 people. They're, they should all wear masks. I'll wear a mask. I'd be fine. But if I'm not vaccinated, I won't go do it. Right. Uh, David writes, did you read the last one? I can't even remember. There's only yes. two people yes. here. My <laughs> gosh. It's your turn. It's your turn. Dear Twiv, greetings from North Central Florida, where it is a very hot 17.3 positivity rate. I was going to say 17.3C is not very hot, right? So positivity is very high, yeah. Our local health department's response to this heat wave has been to reduce testing to one day per week between the hours of 8 a.m. and noon. (laughs) Two (laughs) things, this is a quote now from Albert Einstein. Two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. (laughs) That's a great quote. Yeah. It's not a good policy to reduce testing, Florida. Yeah. The past few episodes of TWIV have been awesome. To see well over 100 years of experience opine, debate, and share is truly a pleasure to witness, including the part when Brienne reaches out to gather additional expertise from family in real time, right? Just texting texting her sister. And of course, also Rich was emailing um, Jason McClellan last Friday. Mm -hmm. I would really appreciate it if you would call a meeting of the TWIV roundtable to discuss with the appropriate caveats in a similar manner. Your thoughts on the mRNA vaccine's possible impact on viral load and thus transmissibility from those who have been vaccinated. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's no need to have a, a roundtable because we don't know, right? We don't know on how the, the mRNA vaccines are going to impact shedding and transmissibility. And we will know, apparently, Moderna and Pfizer are doing those studies now. So maybe we'll know in a couple of months. And that's just what I mentioned. Tony Fauci said, please wear your masks until then. I am hoping that the mRNA vaccines reduce shedding and transmission enough, reduce shedding sufficiently to to inhibit transmission, right? That's the hope. But we don't know if that's the case and we just have to see. Right. And then we will have a round table with the data, right? Right, right. Jennifer writes, Dear TWIV team, my experience with the Shingrix vaccination was extreme. First, at the inoculation site, I felt like my arm had been hit by a baseball bat. Two weeks later, I developed a severe neurological reaction, pain and stinging on the left side of my face, no hives or welts. I saw my internist and her fear was that if I had the second booster shot, the neuralgia, trigeminal, could become permanent and therefore she strongly recommended that I not have the booster shot. It took over two months for the pain to subside and now two years later, I still occasionally have a zap across the left side of my face. I don't know if other people have had this type of reaction, but I thought I would let you know. Thanks for all you do, the over-my-head discussions, the playful banter, and the great recommendations. Sincerely, Jennifer. So um, I think I'm abnormal. I had no experience with either Shingrex. I have no experience with problems ever with um, flu shots. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't react. I think, you know, based on what happened. I think your internist was wise to just say, don't go for the second booster. Hmm. Um, But um, it's fine for you to let us know, but really you should have reported that to the adverse effects Mm -hmm. reporting so that that can be tabulated uh, in the Shingrex data file. So, and maybe that was done by your internist, who knows. Yeah, I'm looking at the Shingrix site and, you know, the common side effects there, you know, the injection site pain and redness, muscle pain, tiredness, headache, shivering, fever, upset stomach, and severe reactions, hives, swelling of the face, throat, difficulty, breathing, fast heartbeat, dizziness, and weakness, but not what you have said. So it sounds unusual. And, and if, uh, yeah, I guess the provider would report it to VAERS, V-A-E-R-S dot H-H-S dot gov. Hmm. I haven't had it yet. Right. Anybody else have uh, this neuralgia? Let us know. That's interesting. 
um, Deborah writes, I've been listening to TWIF for a long time and more consistently during the pandemic. Since the start of the pandemic, I believe your team has been stating that the virus was caught from a natural source and not lab-derived source, despite the fact that Wuhan has a large virology lab. I recently saw on Twitter that the Taiwan News is saying the pandemic is due to an escape of SARS-CoV-2 from the Wuhan lab following gain-of-function testing that is purportedly explained in TWIV 615. Doctor, And that's uh, my first interview with Peter Daschak. <laughs> Dr. Dashak seems to be saying that the Wuhan lab found an, a few wild coronaviruses that would infect humanized mice, that somehow these escaped from the lab, implied by his use of the word spillover. And he knew prior to the interview that these would cause very dangerous and untreatable disease, as had already been identified and treatment attempted in Wuhan. He's so indifferent about the spillover, and I think he knows much more than he's explaining while giving his sales pitch as to why his organization needs more funding. I really do not trust him much. It's concerning to me that this undated interview was released in TWIV 615 on, on June 4th or May 19th, 2020, although the Taiwan News says the interview was 12-9 and three weeks before the announcement of an outbreak. Although I appreciate all the work you do to bring current and rational information on a complex topic to us all, I do wish that the idea of the spillover or other means of escape to the outside population resulting in untreatable disease was not minimized during the interview. Okay, let me let me clarify here. So I interviewed Peter Daszak in Singapore on December 9th. And then I, I came home. And then the, basically right after that, the pandemic began and there was no time to release that episode. I normally would have released it right away, but we started doing COVID episodes. And so he didn't get released till May. So there's nothing nefarious about that, I assure you. I'm just... You know, I couldn't schedule it. And what Peter was talking about, and, and which he also talked about in a subsequent episode, which the press is ignoring, um, they're all focusing on this initial one. But in the second one, he talks about spillover as well. Right after SARS-1, people went into the countryside and they found SARS-like viruses in bats. We didn't know that they were there. And they found that they could infect human cells in the lab. And, and he mentions the serological surveys done in China, which showed that some people had antibodies against the virus. But those viruses are very different from SARS-CoV-2. They had nothing to do with this current outbreak. So they didn't bring them to the lab and work on them and they got out. There's no way that that happens. And of course, Peter is referring to the potential of spillover, um, that these viruses have the potential to infect human cells and they could spill over into the human population. And in the case of the serological surveys, which uh, Lin Fa Wang did with Peter, and Peter summarized those two in the second episode. Remember, Kathy, he said, oh, he, Lin Fa called me. He said, these, these samples are positive. That is a spillover. Somehow those people got infected with these viruses, but they didn't cause any illness and they didn't cause an outbreak. So that's the story behind that. And there's nothing nefarious to anything that Peter says. We do not minimize spillover. We talk about it all the time. So, I, if Kathy's, anything, we're, we're whistleblowing about it. Be be aware this could happen. It's something you need to be concerned about. Um, one thing that uh, Deborah wrote is that uh, he found a few wild coronaviruses that would infect, or the Wuhan lab found a few wild coronaviruses that would infect humanized mice. Um, that connotes different things to different people, but I think here this was. Uh, perhaps some of these wild coronaviruses that could infect mice that had uh, an ACE2 receptor. Maybe that's yeah. all that means, as opposed to yeah. a humanized mouse, which means something different immunologically. Yeah, um, for sure. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, I I agree. I think that if you if you listen to that interview, he's clearly indicating that Spillover can occur. We need to do this kind of surveillance. We need to do these studies so that we can be aware of where these coronaviruses are. We talked last week about the fact that they're actually um, focused more in the very southern part of China and then in the Southeast Asia countries that are bordering that, that that's where the highest abundance of bats are. And so that's someplace where we really should be having more surveillance. Yeah, it's funny. These um, 
I got a, I got an email from an Italian TV station this morning. They want to use bits of that Dashak interview, I guess, for the same purpose to say, you know, it started to, in a lab. To, to <laughs> cherry pick it and say that, and that's that's yeah. not right. So I mean, that, those viruses are, we're talking about twenty two thousand and four, five, six. They're very distant from SARS-CoV-2. They're not the precursor at all. But as Kathy said, we need to do that work to figure out the potential. So, right. We do you want to do the next one? It's similar. Yeah, you know, we we. This is from Jesse, who's basically saying respond to this Taiwan news article. It's funny they listen right. to the episode because they say, and then Professor Racaniello asks him this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, Kathy, what's funny to me? This is published. Last May, and they're just discovering it? Right, right. Well, I think it's because, as you have said, he's on this WHO team. And so yeah, there's some yeah. pushback about that. And so then they're looking into anything they can find on the internet about Peter Dashak, and they find this. So, yes, that's true. Now, so of, Jesse also wants to know about the Moderna and Pfizer allergic reactions, which I'm going to ask Daniel tomorrow on uh, or Thursday on the clinical report because I don't know anything about that. I've heard that there are some in California, but I'm not sure what's going on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why don't you take Soren? Okay. Soren writes, hello, Twi gang. It's unseasonably warm, 6 degrees Celsius, 40 degree, 42 degrees Fahrenheit here in London right now. Dark and cloudy, occasional light rain. In episode 706, John, the retired engineer physicist, argued for a multi-criteria weighted decision-making approach to COVID mitigation. John's approach sounds sensible, but it is dangerously wrong in one crucial respect. Infections increase exponentially. Any level of infection that your economy can tolerate will keep increasing exponentially until it cannot be ignored. According to German research, the optimal level of COVID intervention is R equals 0.75. So I think that's like R naught is the yeah, R that they're R, R factor, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Harsher mitigations require too much effort. Weaker efforts prolong the pandemic and its damaging effects. And it gives a link that I didn't look at and I'm guessing is going to be all in German. Um, uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, no, it isn't in German, but I didn't look at it until just now. So um, anyway, he gives a link supporting that statement. Deniers are correct that severe lockdowns don't correlate with low cases because the causality is often backwards. Governments respond to high cases and deaths with severe lockdowns. However, prompt lockdowns work. It's cheaper and easier to quickly extinguish a small fire than to wait to extinguish a big fire. And he gives a reference to an article in The Lancet. Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, Vietnam, and Thailand are not running out of workers, food, drugs, material, water, energy, specialist technicians, computers, networks, and transportation because they reacted too quickly or decisively. The U.S. and the U.K. are suffering the prolonged consequences of inadequate and delayed reaction, not overreaction. Pandemic versus economy is a false choice. These interests are aligned. We need a healthy population to build a healthy economy. And I, I think I've tried to say that all along and that, you know, you got to get the virus under control if you want to have the economy under control. It's not an either or kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And also if you, if you react early, it's better, right? <laughs> because, right. you know, China reacted quite early. They locked down Wuhan really early in January and that really mm -hmm. helped. And we didn't, we didn't. Yeah. And now we're still... You know, the UK just locked down, right? And I mean, it's right. a bit late. <laughs> right. Anyway, I thought that was a nicely put uh, article. I like that. And this 0.75, mm -hmm. I I think we did an article a while ago where the it was it may have been a related one where they looked at different R levels, right, that you could achieve. And they said below 0.75 is economically disastrous. So you, you can't do that. Yeah. Jill writes, greetings from Tenerife, a delightful volcanic island in the Atlantic where we are enjoying our winter with 20 degrees C and blue skies. Wow. Let me see where this is. <laughs> I'm not it's even sure. Is it a Pacific? Somewhere uh, moderately near the equator. No, it's off of uh, Spain or oh, the northern part of Africa. It's near the Canaries. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what are you doing there, Jill? You live there? Wow. Cool. A retired dentist. 
Could you tell me? Yeah. Does the new technology used in the production of the new mRNA vaccines reduce the use of laboratory animals? I'd really be really interested to know as this is an important factor to me personally. Thank you for making your lectures and podcasts so accessible. So the um, the preclinical testing of this or any other vaccine has to be done in animals, right? right. You have to put them in whatever you decide, mice, hamsters, ferrets, non-human primates, to see an immune response and characterize it and then to do challenge studies to see if uh, the response is protective. So I would say it does not reduce uh, because it, you still – you don't have to – propagate the virus, but that would not involve animals anyway. It would just involve cells and culture in the laboratory. So it does not. All right. Right, Kathy? Right. So I would say the development of the vaccines is going to use the same amount of laboratory animals, regardless of the platform. And the production of these vaccines and the production of any of the vaccines that I can think of are not going to be using laboratory animals. They're going to be grown in large vats or or things like that. I mean, did we ever create vaccines from, well, I guess maybe all the way back to smallpox in the earlier centuries. Yeah, the cows, but, right? <laughs> the cows. But uh, in the modern day, animals haven't been used to produce any of the material that's going into vaccines. Yeah. So it sounds like you'll have to wait for well, you, you know, they're all using animals, Jill, so you, you yeah. take your choice, yeah. Uh, take the next one, please. Junji writes, Rich reminds me of my grandfather, my mother's father. Although my grandfather was in agriculture, no formal education, he was always trying genetic improvements. I think he and friends developed a garlic variety named Lavinia, the city where they were living at the time. I remember he proudly showed an orange he cultivated and the quality he achieved. In Japan, they have similar stuff, like a $50 strawberry unit. Okay. And Rich and my grandfather kind of have similar biotypes. Just interesting what memories are. That's cool. I think Mm -hmm. so when you listen to us for a while, you start to compare. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Japan in a supermarket and seeing, you know, $50 melons and little boxes of grapes, you know, with 10 grapes for 20. It's just amazing, the prices. Wow. Wow. And if I recall, Junji lives in Japan. Oh, now we have a poem from Lagaya. Now, this is cool because people are starting to send poems more Mm -hmm. because they, they know we like poems. And this is called Signs Along Route 66. You've tried the ultraviolet and bleach straight into your veins. You've tried Aunt Ida's potions and hydroxychloroquine. Eight vitamins and herbals till surrender flags you wave. You likely would do just as well ingesting Burma shave. (laughs) That's good. I don't know what, oh, Burma shave is a thing. Burma shave, the Burma shave signs. Yeah. You don't, maybe you didn't travel on the highways as a kid, but if you did, you would have seen the Burma shave signs and, if you saw them on the other side of the highway, you would tr- tr- read them backwards and yeah. So they were famous for uh, posting so humorous that, poems yeah, on sequential be, highway signs. Cool. Yep. Yep. Uh, so this is what this would be. Each line would be in another sign, right? Very right. nice. Like, I, yeah, right. Very nice. I like that. Mm-hmm. Anthony writes, those claiming human DNA modified by mRNA vaccine and gives a link. There is inadequate knowledge to define either the probability of unintended events or the consequences of genetic modifications. That sounds like it's a quote from the paper. Yep, I see this is. quote being passed around as proof of the danger of the vaccine. Of course, the paper says no such thing. It raised the question of horizontal transfer among viruses. <laughs> for what it's worth, Anthony. The, the yeah. paper is, is by Vivian Chan. It's called Use of Genetically Modified Viruses and Engineered Virus Vector Vaccines, Environmental Effects. And that statement is from it, yeah. So they've cherry-picked that statement yep. out to claim that the mRNA vaccine can modify DNA, which just shows a misunderstanding of molecular biology and but a lot people, of other As things. you said earlier, people cherry-pick and they make... Uh, yeah. So years yeah. ago, 
a science reporter came to interview me at Columbia. The um, so I, I, a, a group in the UK had taken polio virus and put an antigenic site from HIV on it, right? And they said, oh, this could be an HIV vaccine. So he came to talk to me about it. And I said, I'm not really excited about this. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. And it never did. Mm -hmm. And he talked to me for a while and filmed it and all this. And then he, then at the same time, a paper had been published in Cell, which you may remember, which claimed you could make transgenic mice by taking sperm and just adding DNA to it and then using it to make offspring. It turned out to be wrong, but it made a big splash. It was a cell paper. He said, what do you think about that that cell paper where they made transgenic mice with the sperm? And I said, that could be really interesting. That could be a very exciting. And he took that answer and spliced it onto the question about the HIV vaccine. Uh, Can you imagine? Wow. wow. I mean, that's not right. Cause I didn't even answer no. that question that way. No. Right? That's yeah. cherry picking. Yep. Cherry picking. Um, so I've gotten a lot of questions from people about, can the mRNA vaccine modify human DNA? Okay. And unfortunately, you know, this, this preprint came out a couple of weeks ago from, I don't know if, you, I think it was a Friday episode, but it was, but from Rudy Yanish saying that, uh -huh. you know, if you infect cells, Producing reverse transcriptase. Overproducing reverse transcriptase, the viral RNA is reverse transcribed and can integrate. <laughs> okay. And so people are saying, well, could the mRNA vaccine integrate? And I, I usually say, okay, look, it's, it's a pretty rare event. It could, but most of the time it's not going to matter. It's a somatic cell. But then again, cancers arise from somatic cells. So I think it's I don't know what the frequency likelihood is, but it's got to be pretty well, rare, and if it, right? if it needs to be a cell that's overproducing reverse transcriptase. I mean, how much endogenous reverse transcriptase do our cells have? Yeah, it's quite low, right? We can barely detect it by enzymatic assays, yeah. Right. So I think it's very low. I say to people, look, the danger of that is minuscule compared to getting COVID. So yeah. I would I would worry about that. Yeah. Uh, John writes, my wife and I love listening to your show podcast about viruses, bacteria, human sickness, and health, and whatever you and your guests are discussing. <laughs> However, there is one aspect of the pandemic that needs more publicity. I'm referring to the problem of ensuring that poor people, both in the U.S. and especially in places like Africa, Asia, Latin America, South America, have timely access to the vaccine. I have heard that the industrialized nations have already purchased almost the entire available supply of the vaccine. And the track record of health care for the poor in the U.S. leaves much to be desired. Also, at least Pfizer is insisting on proper rights protection or property rights. I'm not sure which one that is, yeah. which will enable yeah. Pfizer to continue to change government to charge government's full price for its vaccine. Considering that Pfizer received government funding for its vaccine research and development, it seems quite unfair to expect poor countries to buy sufficient vaccine doses to vaccinate their entire population if they cannot get their doses at a reduced price or no cost at all. I urge you to talk about this issue because I fear many of your listeners may not be aware of it. And um, John, I agree with you 100% that we have to ensure that other countries who can't make their own vaccines get it, for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I'm... <clears throat> You know, when I see well, people getting immunized, you know, left and right, my colleagues in New York and so forth, it, it, there are a lot of people that don't have access to that. So, you know, at Columbia, you can walk into an armory now and get online, but poor people don't have access to that. And I, I know it's an issue. I don't know how to deal with it. I do think that some com some companies are, uh, you know, Pfizer and Moderna do want to make some of their vaccine uh, designated for countries that cannot make their own. I'm, I know that they're concerned about that, but I agree that it's an issue. I will point out one thing, though. Pfizer did not get Operation Warp Speed money for their vaccine. They make a point of showing that, but Moderna did, of course. Um, I, I, I think it's, I agree, and I think our listeners should be aware of it because it's not just us that should be getting these vaccines. Right, right. And it's important because we essentially need the whole world to be covered at some point if we want to see some reduction in 
devastation from this virus. Yeah. I, I It's always a yeah. problem with all kinds of medications. And, you know, the people, I've always argued that we should give it away to countries. It would be cheap for us to do. It would cost a lot less than some of the stuff we do. And it would really help people. But it doesn't seem to have uh, any traction, unfortunately. All right, we have one more. <clears throat> uh, it's my turn. Yep. yep. Okay, Oliver writes, Dear Twivers, I'm catching up on Twiv and I suspect someone has already clarified, but I think this is Fauci's article in Cell that Edward's poem was mentioning. I'm sure you all have seen this before, but we're confused because the poem was talking about a paper he wrote well before the current pandemic. Okay, so yes, it I read that poem and I did hesitate and explained why later because mm. I wasn't figuring out something about Fauci's article in Cell. So this is an article um, entitled Emerging and Re-Emerging Infectious Diseases, Influenza as a Prototype of the Host Pathogen Balancing Act from 2006. So yeah, forgive me for not remembering. Do you remember um, what aspect article. of the poem it was? Uh, it was just it was just a th kind of throwaway line about Fauci and his paper in Cell or something like that. So uh, yeah, yeah. Let me see, Edward. Here we go. Here it is. I, oh yeah, Fauci warned in Cell the end. This was not. More viruses right. would come in mass by the lot. <laughs> okay. Well, that's thank by you, Edward. Yeah, that's um for clarifying. That's Age great. of Lost. Right. That's the name of the poem. Great poem, by the way. Yes. Thank you for right. clarifying that. It's very good. All right. That brings us to, to the end of, well, this batch of email. There are plenty more, but right. um, that's good. We got through these anyway. Mm -hmm. And let's do some picks of the week. Okay. What do you have, Kathy? So I have something. Uh, 15 YouTubers pay, play Telestrations. So <laughs> Telestrations is a game I didn't know. And um, it's sort of like the telephone game, but one person draws something and then another person uh tries to guess what it is or something like that. I don't know. And then, and then they, uh, anyway, this is different because this is, they, they kind of play it by YouTube and it's a bunch of sort of famous YouTube channel people. Um, at the moment, I can only remember physics girl uh, as one of them, <laughs> but um, it's amazing because one person uh, uh, there's, there's a, a set of drawings and then the other person narrates it and then that narration is taken and somebody else draws something to that and then to that drawn thing somebody else makes a new narration and so forth mm -hmm. and it goes on and it's just a really good example of sort of the telephone game but using youtube so it's really fun and if you do listen um pay attention around minute 11 there's a sun there's there's like three little icons that are supposed to be uh um, spring, summer, fall, and winter, but those mm. are misinterpreted by the next person. And uh, it's just kind of interesting how somebody then interprets what the sun is. So just something fun to watch on YouTube. It's cool. It's very nice. Um, uh, my pick is um, the website of a science writer, Vince Spicer. And I met Vince last week at a Zoom meeting. I was invited to join this group of independent journalists, uh, 20 or 30 of them, who uh, wanted to share their the things they were trying to achieve and some problems and, and so forth. And Vince was part of this group. And um, I noticed that he likes to use Vince, <laughs> first mm -hmm. of all, not Vince. In, in contrast to you. <laughs> in contrast to me. But anyway, he's a science writer and I wanted to just uh, – share his website with everyone. Um, we'll, I'll probably get him on sometime on to Twiv to talk about what he does, but uh, he does a lot of cool stuff. He writes articles, he writes books, he does podcasts, he does film and television. He's given TED Talks about all kinds of science out there, not just, uh, you know, virology. So um, you should check it out. His latest book is The World in a Grain, The Story of Sand and How It Transformed Civilization, right? It's a kind right. of cool science book that I really like. So I I saw this and I immediately sent it to my brother because he reads lots of these books that have just one word titles that are yeah. like everything about salt. And I said, this guy missed his chance to have a one word title. It could have just salt. been sand. Absolutely. Sand. This one, yes. Has your brother so, read yeah. Oxygen? 
I think so. It's great Probably. by Nick Lane. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Good. There's, there's, you know, five or 10 of them that, that yeah. yeah. One word books. So, anyway, Vince Beiser, check that out. Then yeah. we have uh, a bunch of listener picks. These weren't sent in, but they're links to things that the listeners like. So I thought they should be a listener pick. And a, and a couple of them, I guess they're all this acapella science piece, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we've had acapella science guy yes. on before, but yep. this one is a sea shanty about COVID-19. And so it's on TikTok, it's on YouTube, it's on some other, it's on Bandcamp. Um, and I think his name is uh, Wellerman. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, so it's very good. And also I did hear a story the other day that sea shanties are all the rage. Mm. <laughs> so it's too bad Rich isn't here, but hopefully he'll hear this later. And um, it just seems kind of like a barbershop thing or a yeah. sailing sea shanty thing. So, yeah. So we cool. have from Bob, who is just a science teacher. We have from David, who is uh, at Carolina Internal Medicine, an MD, and then uh, Janet, who is in Halifax. They have all right. independently sent these in. So that's cool. And then one other one, Bob also sent in one from uh, a couple of years ago, uh, mm-hmm. CRISPR-Cas9. And it's right. uh, CRISPR-Cas9 instead of Mr. Sandman, it's CRISPR-Cas9. And it's really well done. And it's and he at the end, he has a bit about you can go watch and see how he put it together. And he credits the person that uh, vetted all the things he said about the CRISPR-Cas9 science and so forth. So it's... It's definitely worth cool. checking out. Speaking of acapella, did you see the the, the the song that the listener wrote for us last week? Um, oh yeah, I had seen it in the in the show notes ahead of time. I was the one, in fact, who put in the YouTube link that right, right. Dixon said he listened to. Can so, you sing yeah. it for us? I will maybe later. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because you sing well, right? Well, so, I don't even I remember have, that. I have a, yeah, I have a choral voice, not a solo voice. So remember I that. See. I didn't know there was a difference. Okay, yeah, well, but I, I, <laughs> I can't even remember the ma- the melody for for that song. Um, I haven't listened to the many years. But well, I hadn't either, so that's why I went and found the put that in. Yeah. All right, it's Twiv seven oh nine midweek Twiv Microbe TV for the show notes. Send your questions and comments to us Twiv at Microbe. Dot TV, and if you'd like to support us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And if you're wondering if Kathy and I have ever done a TWIV on our own, yes, we have. Mm-hmm. I think at least one, right? Oh, I think we did three or four uh, way back when. The one I remember the, is when we talked about a life in the day of a scientist, right? Right, right. <laughs> and that I remember the one where the week before was a, a certain title. Uh, uh, it was something about one is the loneliest number. And then, right, right. And then the paper was about uh, two different viruses. It was a Glenn Rawl paper. And so it was two can be as bad as one. So I was so proud that I figured out that title. That was good. <laughs> we didn't have that. Alan. That's right. That's right. So yeah, sometimes we do. I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Yellow. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. So this is lyrics written by Wendy, a TWIV fan to a song from Jesus Christ Superstar, the rock opera, and the song is The Last Supper. Always thought that I'd be a virologist, knew that I would make it if I tried. Then when COVID came, I could work on therapeutics so we'd help the sick among us to survive. Seems like we have failed to help each other. Christmas parties, weddings all too soon.
Science has pushed ahead, but the culture didn't bother. Now our mores held in conflict with the truth. Somehow thought that we would have a leader. Making plans to stop the viral spread. Trump said drinking bleach could make us feel better. Now the U.S. leads the world in people dead. 